Let's start with a before and after. So we have this wacky shed in our backyard. At one point it was a chicken coop with heat, electricity, and running water. Then for years it was just used as a good old fashioned gizarden shed. Since we've owned the home, it's just housed our yard tools. The problem is that it didn't have big enough doors for a tractor or a riding mower. So this video solves that problem. I think it's important to set goals for a project. Doing so will ensure that the end result will be farther away from terrible. In this case, I wanted to be able to park my riding mower and tractor in this 12 by 14 foot shed. This meant that I needed offset double carriage doors on two sides of the shed. So I'll be making four doors. Another goal I had was I wanted to turn a gross eyesore into an asset for our property. While we aren't looking to sell our house anytime soon, though everything's for sale for the right price, I always have a resale in mind. A nice shed is a welcomed addition to a house sitting on a few acres. My final goal is to create a passable space for my mother-in-law to stay when she visits. In an attempt to lure her and her cat into this shed, I named it The Shed and Breakfast. And if you get that joke, you have a good or maybe a bad taste in TV shows. Okay, so what I'm doing is making a grilled cheese sandwich where the cheese is a piece of plywood and each piece of bread is a face frame. For the outer slice of bread, I'm using Eastern White Pine, which does okay outdoors and it takes paint well. I'm using the spacers so that all four doors turn out the same. I'm using biscuits for joinery uh, versus screws because I think like they'll hold up better to the elements, but this is just a guess based on a sizable guts feeling. If you've watched a few of my awesome YouTube videos, you'll know that I'm a biscuit joint kind of gal. But the biscuit has one major flaw, and that's the slots are very wide. So this is a case where the domino wins the day, when a narrow joint is needed. Here is a progress shot, looking noise. Since these are outdoor frames, a bevel should be added to facilitate water drainage. Quick note, cutting these bevels will cause the joinery for the center rail to shift a little bit. I wasn't quite sure by how much, so when cutting the biscuit slots, I offset them by like an eighth of an inch. This ended up being spot on. Also, I drilled one of the domino slots five millimeters deeper for the same reason. At this point, I can hear what you're thinking. Uh, why is Mike building a door using this weird method? Well, this is my attempt to build a shed door that looks really good, but won't ever sag. My thinking is with this center panel that's a full sheet of plywood, these doors will remain square over time. Aside from rotting, which will occur if paint isn't kept up, the only thing that really could go wrong is a hinge pulling out, which is actually a pretty easy repair. So time will tell, but that's a look into my thinking for this project. With the exterior frames done, it's time to move on to the interior frames, which will be made from poplar, and I'll use pocket screws to speed up production. I considered not putting frames on the inside. I decided to go ahead and build them because we live in an area that can get really windy. So I thought a little extra heft would be worth the effort. Maybe not needed, but I didn't want to find out the hard way. Once again, I'm using spacers for consistency and I'm setting this mid rail in place so that it will be the rabbit for the polycarbonate window panels to be installed later. Next up is the cutout for the window. I would like to mention that this is an exterior grade half inch plywood, but it's an undersized plywood. So it's sold as 15 30 seconds of an inch, which is 0.469 expressed as a decimal. However, we are now undersizing our undersized plywood. So the actual, actual thickness of this plywood as printed on the plywood is 0.438, which if you convert that back to a fraction is 7 16 of an inch. So yeah, color me confused. Oh yeah, and also it's not very flat. I don't want to get too quixotic and I won't joust at this windmill for too long, nor will I be any more redundant than necessary. But who in the capital F word comes up with these schemes? The answer to that question, I'm sure, comes from a pencil neck and a suit in a boardroom other than my boardroom who wouldn't know a hammer from a mallet. 
I fully understand that their stock goes up a quarter of a point every time they shave another 30 thousandths off their plywood. But hey, maybe I'm just jealous my company can't get away with the same racket. Um, Mike, why is my front door seven eighths of an inch thick? No, it's one and a half inches thick, but the actual thickness is seven eighths of an inch thick. So yeah, uh, deal with it, fictional customer. Um, Mike, here's your final payment, and it's undersized by 30 thousandths. Okay, sorry about that. I'm now down off my soapbox and back in the shop. I'm sandwiching the plywood with some construction adhesive and nails, which are just to hold it temporarily, then screws to finish it off. Here's one place where a nice flat bench really helps. I'm clamping firmly to my bench and fastening the sandwich all together. Since the doors will take the shape of my bench, I know they're going to be nice and flat. Nothing better than when the shop apprentice comes out to see what I'm up to, especially when it's something that isn't too dangerous so he can help. After a little coaching, he was able to drive all the screws in one of the doors. Of course, he's got to show off for the camera, though. Are you making a YouTube video of me? Maybe. Can you do that? Maybe. I assembled the four doors on a Friday. I thought it would be a good idea to leave them all to sit over the weekend on my bench so they could cure on a flat reference surface. After cleaning up the edges, I set the doors back on my bench because it's time to make a hinge jig. But hinges are typically sold by width and height measurements. These happen to be four by four. And these also have a non-removable pin, which is necessary since the hinge barrel will be on the outside of the building. What I'm doing here is making a jig that will allow me to route the door and jam at one time and do it consistently from door to door. I've cut the center pieces the width of the hinge, plus a tiny bit of wiggle room and of course some cutouts for the hinge barrels. I used the hinge to set the height and a little wiggle room, of course. And then the outer two pieces are there just to hold those center pieces in place. Once dry, I clean off any squeeze out and cut to length. Next step is to add a dado that will locate and house a spine. This is a critical step. The width of the spine determines how far the hinge will lay onto the door and jam. And also I cut from both sides to make sure that the dado is centered. I make sure my initial setup is close and then I sneak up on final fit. I glue and screw the spine in place, and this jig is ready for prime time. Off camera, I milled up my jams. Again, this is Eastern White Pine. I add a rabbit to the top of the left and right jams. This will help me locate my hinge template and also make assembling the jams easier. These are called door bucks. I have a few sets kicking around my shop. I showed how I made these along with a few other door building jigs in another video. I'll put a link to that at the end of this video for those interested. I start by setting the reveal for the top of the door. In this case, that's one eighth of an inch. Then I clamp the jig to the door. Next, I set the jams rebate. Jams rebate? Jams rabbit? The rabbit on the jam, flush with the top of the jig, whatever. And I clamp it in place. After that, it's time for a router party. I'm using a half inch diameter hinge mortising bit. I happen to like these DeWalt trim routers. Uh, they have a neat light, the dust collection is adequate. My first complaint would be the strain relief where the plug wire pops out. Good lord, that thing is well endowed. My other routers get jealous. I normally don't use square corner hinges. In this case, I couldn't find radius corner hinges with a non-removable pin. 
So that leaves me squaring corners, no big deal. Leave the routing jig in place, and this is an easy task. With the hinges in place, I use a center punch to mark screw locations. Normally, I would do this with a VIX bit. However, I broke the VIX bit for this particular size screw. So this is my backup plan. Time for a song recommendation while I pilot these hinge holes. Was recently sitting around late at night with a family member enjoying some libations and listening to music. We were playing that game of, oh yeah, you think that song is good, man? Well, how about this one? He played the song Infinite Dreams by Iron Maiden, and at that point I had to concede defeat. That song is simply fantastic. If you like heavy metal, as you should, I suggest you give it a spin. I install the two screws in the pine first. Screws can easily wander when screwing into the edge of plywood. Um, I gotta say, I've done this very process uh, many, many times, but I still enjoy it when things come together nicely. Nothing better than a door that works as it should. It's a simple thing that isn't necessarily easy to do. It's also a place for carpenters to really show off their skills. I put a right and left door together with a spacer between them and measure so I can cut the top jam to length. Just a couple of finishing details. I add the center molding. I sand just a little because I guess I feel I have to for some reason. And I add a back bevel so the doors swing open without touching. I should fire my cameraman for this shot. Um, my track saw doesn't quite make the cut so I finish it off by hand. I like to prime and then do the caulking. That might sound weird, um, but I find that I can see the areas that need caulk more easily if the primer is already down. After a long break, because of, you know, stuff, uh, it's time to install the doors. I have to say, this video almost got deleted due to hard drive space, but alas, here we are. So I assemble the jam pieces into a door frame. I also cut some 16 millimeter five wall polycarbonate into correct sizes for the windows, and I add some foil tape to keep out the bugs. After framing the rough opening, I put the door frame in place. I put a few shims in to hold it. I shim and check level and level and check shim a lot. I want the doors to require minimal fussing once I hang them. I start adding screws and adjust for plumb and level as I go. On each hinge jam, I put screws above the upper hinge and below the lower hinge and one right near the middle hinge. I do this so I can shim near the upper and lower hinges to adjust the doors ever so slightly after hanging them. There's always a little drag or a little something. So that's what my demonstrative hands are trying to show here is that the doors are dragging a little, but not to worry, nothing some shims can't fix. So as I'm tapping the shim, watch the gap at the bottom grow. This is levering the door up. I can further this adjustment by adding a screw right by the upper hinge and tightening. This gets the doors just where they need to be so they're swinging freely. For some reason, I didn't capture this when installing the doors on the back of the shed. So here is the pleasing finished shot showing how my shim strategy has paid off on the front doors. With the four doors swinging freely, I add some trim. It has a 1 8 inch by 1 half inch little notch cut out of it. This will allow me to add some weather stripping down the line.
I lay the polycarbonate panels down in a bed of adhesive and further hold them in place with some square moldings. I peel off the protective film and bask in the awesomeness. Um, not really, I'm pretty much totally over this project at this point and I just want it done as my body language clearly shows. All right, back to the starting point. It's tight for sure, but I can now fit my mower and tractor in the shed and breakfast. I will, however, need to build a bunk or something for my mother-in-law. I added a knob to the front set of doors so I can get in and out, cane bolts to keep them from swinging in the wind. I also added some latch pins for added security. Building and installing large doors like this isn't easy, but overcoming the challenges gives a great sense of achievement. I'm super happy with the end results and having the extra space in our garage is very nice. I hope you enjoyed following along. Thank you for watching. Till next time. Oh, and since I bought it, let's go out with some drone footage.